What if your organization had to slash its carbon footprint in half on a tight deadline? Sounds impossible, right? Well, that's exactly what Paris promised for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. In 2017, Paris won the bid to host this year's Olympics, in part because of their pledge to cut carbon emissions in half compared to recent games. It was a bold move, and they've spent the last seven years learning on the go. Many organizations face a similar challenge. They want to make ambitious sustainability commitments, but feel overwhelmed by the challenge and don't know where to start. They may believe that pushing for environmental sustainability means sacrificing profits or making things more expensive or less convenient for consumers. But is that really true? To find out what Paris learned on their decarbonization journey, I recently interviewed Georgina Grenin, the Director of Environmental Excellence for the Paris Games. Grenin has had a long career of championing environmental sustainability, having even played a role in formulating the 2015 Paris Climate Accords. In this video, Grenin shares her takeaways for organizations wanting to fast-track their own decarbonization goals. Whether your organization has already begun its sustainability journey or is still at the starting line, there's a lot to be learned from her experience. Thank you so much for joining us today, Georgina. Uh, the Paris 2024 Olympic Committee made a commitment to reduce carbon emissions by half compared to recent Olympic Games. This is an ambitious commitment, and as the Director of Sustainability for the Paris Games, you were tasked with making it happen. How did you approach a sustainability challenge of this size? As organizers of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, this required to make uh, a lot of decisions very early on. You know, reducing carbon emissions was part of the DNA of Paris 2024. Uh, so the decisions had to be part of the DNA too, you know. Uh, one of the big decisions was to build very little compared to previous games. This is why we're using 95% of existing or temporary sports infrastructure and building only one stadium because of the needs of the games. But then after you build very little, then you need to secure that what you build is built with very low carbon. The village, for example, has been built with 30% less carbon per square meter compared to normal construction of today. Another big decision, choose the venues so that they are accessible by public transportation. And then you can encourage people to use public transportation only. There are a lot of organizations that, uh, you know, make ambitious uh, sustainability commitments, but they often find it overwhelming to take on such big challenges. How do you think organizations can identify where they should start their decarbonization efforts? It all started by understanding where the emissions were coming from. You know, where they would come from if we were to do nothing. You know, so we started with a good understanding. One example is energy. You know, uh, normally broadcasters ask for uh, event operators to use diesel generators because they trust us that more than the grid. In our case, you know, French grid is, is, is quite decarbonated compared to normal grid. Uh, and on top of that, we were using 100% renewables. So for us, um, it was quite interesting to say, uh, to use the grid instead of diesel generators. And that helped us decarbonate the energy part of the gains by 80%. Same thing with the food. Uh, the food, we um, did it actually the, the other way around. We said, well, what if we were to do our food service, we need to serve 13 million meals. What if we were to do that with half of the carbon of an average meal? So we start composing the menus with what you have at hand that is seasonal, that is um, uh, local. Uh, and on top of that, put a lot more vegetables on it. And then you start scrapping single use plastics and you start fighting food waste. When you add all that up, um, we are getting <laughs> along with with half the carbon of a normal meat on average for the 13 million meals we had to serve. We had to really pretty much turn every stone to try to find things and then uh, make the necessary changes that we were able to do for us, but also to show the world that it can be done. Then you can leave a legacy and other events, other opportunities can see that if we were able to do it at this scale, then there's no reason why others couldn't do it for theirs. Can you discuss the role of partnerships in achieving sustainability goals at Paris 2024? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, it's, it's, 
it, you can never do it alone. Sustainability is like a, it's like a collective sport. You know, uh, you, you need to play with all your um, stakeholders around you. So for us, it was very, very important to uh, work with our ecosystem to understand how our ecosystem was either creating, uh, uh, for example, emissions and also what solutions they could bring to reduce them and get them to help us, you know, work together in delivering those solutions. In Sloan Management Review, we aim to educate business leaders on, uh, you know, how they can do things better and more sustainably. What are three key strategies you would recommend to business leaders when setting and achieving ambitious sustainability goals? I would start with leadership. You know, if you don't have leaders that are taking this seriously, if you don't set up uh, goals that are, um, I would say, ambitious enough and that are, you know, taken forward by the highest level of the organization, then it's, it's very hard, right? So in our case, this has been led by our president with full support of our board. I would say second is, is give yourself the resources to actually do it. Get the right teams, have in-house resources, or at least outsourced uh, at the right level of what you need. For us, it's been so far essential to have in-house climate experts, in-house circular economy experts, in-house uh, biodiversity protection experts. All those competences have been essential to um, be able to understand and then make all the necessary modifications to challenge the standard way of doing things and finding new solutions. Also, have a collaborative way of operating. As we were saying, the solutions can never come from a single team. They can never come from a single head. Uh, the solutions come from playing collectively. In our case, the the games uh, is also a great you know broadcasting opportunity. So it's a way of uh, getting messages across uh, millions and millions of people who would be watching on on TV on social media. So broadcasting the uh, not just the result but uh, the effort that was taken making that visible is an important part of. Uh, what you're doing. I believe it is because it can show also that, you know, solutions don't come out of a hat. They don't happen overnight. They require people to make decisions that sometimes are not easy. Question I get all the time is, oh, how much more expensive your solutions are? And actually, uh, many of our solutions are not more expensive. Actually, some of them even make savings, right? So this has been part of the challenge for us is that um, you know, our games are run on a private way, you know, with a very definite budget that we don't want to exceed. So um, we had to find solutions that also were compatible with a finite budget. We could not just throw money at it. But then, you know, in parallel to our financial budget, we had our carbon budget. And this helped us, you know, make all the right decisions throughout the way because everyone knew more or less, what was their target that they should not overspend, both in money, but also in, car in carbon. That's really interesting because I think a lot of times business leaders think that doing things more sustainably means spending more money on it than they had budgeted. But I, I think what you're saying is that it's possible to do things both economically and uh, efficiently in terms of carbon usage. If that is, if you put it as one of you know, the objectives as well. Sometimes being more frugal uh, implies being more um, sustainable, but also making savings. And this is this is something that we also embedded in all our operations. Finally, what lasting impact do you hope that the sustainability initiatives of the Paris Games will have? First and most, for uh, the Olympic and Paralympic Games, we are sharing all we have learned, everything we have developed, we're sharing with other committees, you know, of the next upcoming games. We hope to be, have been the, the best so far, but we hope the next ones are going to be even better. Uh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about something that's generated a lot of discussion uh, in the news lately. Some teams uh, are bringing their own air conditioners, uh, it's reported. How do you feel about that? What conversations are you having about that? The conversations started very early on when the decision was made not to put what traditionally is known as air conditioning in the buildings. 
for one simple reason is that the way these buildings have been constructed is different from anything you've seen before maybe uh, and has already secured a much lower temperature inside of the apartments. So uh, this is important as a legacy feature because we didn't want to put um, you know, traditional air conditioning in an entire neighborhood just, just for two times two weeks. This would have created a lot of more carbon emissions that were not necessary for the population that is going to live or work there later on. Um, but of course, if there are some uh, committees that don't trust this or would feel more you know, reassured, if they have, I would say, traditional uh, air conditioning systems, for them, we offer the possibility of renting uh, these units, uh, which are temporary units, and then we're going to secure a second life for those units. So a portion of, you know, the impact of those units gets, you know, reduced out of the fact that they are, don't get trashed after being used for two times two weeks, right? We're proposing a system that is uh, compatible with the needs of every athlete, whether they take this AC or not, um, but also, and moreover, for the legacy of this entire neighborhood. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Georgina. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. I learned so much from that interview with Georgina. We hope you found it informative, too. We really appreciate Georgina taking the time to meet with us right before the Games. To learn more about how Paris pulled off this incredible feat, please check out the article How the 2024 Paris Olympics Fast-Track Decarbonization on the MIT Sloan Management Review website. The link is in the description below. If you'd like to watch more MIT SMR interviews with some of the best subject matter experts in their fields, please check out these playlists for more videos. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.